the Ismin webinar series. And we also would like to take this opportunity to wish you Happy New Year. Uh, and today we are very fortunate that uh, we will have uh, two eminent researcher as well as uh, eminent speaker from uh, two different uh, institution. The first will be uh, Professor or Dr. Evgeny Balik from uh, Department of Neurological Surgery, Rutgers, uh, New Jersey Medical School, uh, United States of America. And uh, second speaker uh, will be Professor Cleopatra Sharalampaki from Colon Medical Center, uh, Germany. So uh, for your information, so this webinar uh, have we started uh, in October 2020. This is the first uh, webinar series on cranial keyhole surgery. And then followed by uh, on 11 December, we have a cranial neuroendoscopic surgery. And today will be the third uh, seminar, uh, a special technique, new technology on confocal microendoscopy. So one of the intention of uh, Ismian Society is to bring and to provide platform for any new technology that leads to minimally invasive technique in neurosurgery with aim to improve patient outcome as well as preservation of neurological function. So it is my great honor to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Evgeny Belik. So he is actually uh, born in Russia and currently uh, undergoing neurosurgical resident training in Rutgers University, New Jersey, United States of America, and also as Assistant Department of Neurosurgery and Innovative Medicine, uh, State, uh, State Medical University, Russia. So he will talk about uh, confocal fluorescent imaging for neurosurgeons from basic concept to clinical implementation. Okay, can we invite Anthony? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. It's a great honor to be uh, in such a prestige uh, webinar. Today, I'm going to talk about the basics aspects on the confocal imaging. And uh, hopefully, by the end of the talk, you would be experts in this technology. Um, I want to thank uh, all the mentors who allowed me to be here and to study all these great technologies from Baroneological Institute, Dr. Pro, and from Russia, Dr. Vadim Bavalsev, and also Professor Charles Mpaki, who inspired me a lot and, all, and uh, some of the work that I've done. So the significance of the topic of um, confocal endomicroscopy is related to the invasive brain tumors. And if we are to embrace this technology, we are, uh, have to embrace the um, concept of extent of resection that may, uh, makes a difference in patients' outcomes. So we all know that glioblastoma cells are spreading throughout the brain um, and looks to a much extent, but um, the more aggressive we are, the more complete the resection is, the better job we do, the better patient outcomes are generally. So um, I wanna bring this concept I wrote, uh, this was written in one of the perspective articles about the uh, proposed additional steps with the small field imaging called handheld optical section in microscopy, which is an additional step to MRI and wide field surgical microscopy that we use. So these additional steps will allow us to visualize cells and nuclei and potentially uh, get something that we are not able to see with our naked eyes. So what it is, it's an optical biopsy uh, it allows to take the actual biopsy that we can um, possibly make an intraoperative diagnosis right away of the type of the tumor. But most importantly for us, for neurosurgeons, we can differentiate between diseased and normal tissue, whether uh, what we see uh, is a tumor or not. Should we reject it or should we stop? It would lead to intraoperative decision-making and uh, at some point maybe lead to improve of the extent of resection. So I'm gonna talk about the principles of fluorescence, 
principles of, of confocal imaging. I'm going to touch about the available systems that are in the market and in the research. And I'm going to talk more about the fluorescein as the contrast agent. And I'm going to bring some of the examples of this imaging. So the principles of fluorescence start with understanding of the light. The light is an electromagnetic wave. Um, so it starts with the low waves with the ultraviolet light. It's a very short, narrow wavelength, and it's very heavy and very um, has high energy. It has so high energy so that there is a, a germicidal UV light in this uh, range of spectrum. It's kind of har harmful. And then the infrared uh, range of spectrum, it has lower energy and uh, it can pass us uh, deeper into the tissue because the wave, you know, can um, uh, wave and hug around the obstacles almost. So human eye can only see the part of the spectrum, but the modern cameras like CCD and ECICMD cameras can actually see much more. And uh, that's why in most of the sophisticated uh, devices, you don't necessarily look at the oculars of the microscope, but you look at the camera. So what is fluorescence? The so fluorescence is the property of the interaction of light and fluorescent material. So what actually happens is that there is an electron on the fluorescent material uh, that gets excited when you illuminate with a blue light or high energy light. The electron goes to the upper orbit on the high energy state then it relaxes to the relaxed excited state and then it goes back to the ground state and then it emits a photon of uh, lower energy. Uh, a little bit stuck, I'm sorry. Trying to, oops, sorry about that. It emits the photon of lower energy, but a different color. So you um, basically use the blue light and then what comes out of the tissue is red or yellow light. And then you can differentiate whether you have the fluorescent material or not. So there are some terms that uh, we should know about. First is Stoke shift. It's a difference in the wavelength of the excitation light that you use to excite the fluorophore and emission light that fluorophore emits outside. There is a quantum yield, means that how many photons you need to uh, put inside the tissue in order to get um, this, the photons of the outside tissue, it's a ratio. So for example, the protoporphyrin, the derivative of 5 ALA, ALA is a very low quantum yield. So you need a very high light to get a few um, uh, glow of the uh, 5 ALA. Fluorescence has high quantum yield, so you need um, very low uh, dim light to excite the fluorophore to get a bright um, shine of fluorescing. And ICG is somewhere in between. There's also molar extinction co coefficient, and as uh, basically the, how readily the molecule absorbs the life of a given wavelength. Then a quenching is factor that decrease fluorescence. I'm going to show it uh, in the example. And photo bleaching. With time, everything photo bleaches. Like when you wear the t-shirt for a long time, the color degrades the same as fluorophore. You shine more lights and it's uh, on it. And then with time, it shines less and less. So quenching. Um, look at these two vials of ICG. One is saturated and one is more diluted. But on the fluorescence image, it more diluted um, fluorophores. It actually brighter. And if you look on the scale and ICG concentrations, you can see that um, with time, it, the fluorescence intensity increases, but then it quenches, it decreases. So this is a principle of quenching. Uh, another principle of um, quenching is that you can attach the additional molecule that would silence the fluorophore, and then with some conformational change, the silencer would be uh, deattached of the fluorophore and the fluorophore would start to shine. This could be used as some advanced uh, new types of chemical probes that are specific for some sort of tissues. But these types of uh, tissue um, probes are still under development. And photo bleaching, like 5LA, if you shine the uh, blue light on the tumor for a long time, the blue, um, the uh, red shine of the uh, 5LA with protoporphyrin will degrade with time. And you can see this is in 
one minute, the um, intensity decrease and two minutes is significantly lower. So the principles uh, of confocal imaging is the principle of optical sectioning. So this is the um, picture from the regular benchtop confocal microscope. And you can see like we're slicing the tissue from top down and it's stained with different fluorophores and you can rotate it and you can look exactly at where the cells are. You can look at the nuclei, you can look at the cytoplasm with appropriate fluorophore. So the idea is to get this technology to the clinic, to the operating room, to be able to do exactly the same in the OR. So what the principle of the optical sectioning? So uh, here we have the laser and what's important, a pinhole. So the light is sh uh, being shined down on the dichroic mirror through the objective and it's focused in the focal plane. The fluorophore gets excited here and it emits lights everywhere in all directions. But some of this light will go in one particular direction and get through this pinhole and gets into the, de the detector. And what's gonna be detected is exactly the information about one point in the space, because all the other information of other points will miss this pinhole and would not be recorded. And by recording one point at a time, step by step, one pixel by pixel, you can reconstruct an image of a certain plane within the tissue on X and Y directions. So this is a principle of fiber optic confocal system. You have the excitation laser, laser which shines a wavelength of 48 nanometers. It shines the light through the tissue in one point uh, at a time. And then uh, the fluorescence uh, gets, uh, material gets excited, excited. And then you have emitted light that gets detected by the detector. And then you have the scanning mechanism that moves this uh, light in different directions. And then you, acquire the information pixel by pixel, point by point. Uh, so available systems. We recently published the review where we summarized all uh, confocal microscope available at that moment. You can group them uh, into two different groups. First is used by pathologist, mainly for ex vivo analysis. Pathologists don't need to be in OR. You get a piece of tissue, you need to process it fast and uh, possibly with less staining and faster. So um, what the goals is staining, um, topical staining is preferable, preferable. Uh, simplified staining is better, uh, or even if, without, if you don't need to stain it, it's even more better. And the imaging principle of the all exuvian analysis, either transmittance, you cut a very thin slices and look through it, through the tissue, or reflectance images. So you look only at this uh, reflected light from the surface. For in vivo analysis used by neurosurgeons, there are very few under microscope available right now. There are, we use some staining. So what are the stainings? We can uh, inject drugs systemically, systemic fluorophores. We can apply fluorophores topically, stain tissues to surface. And we can also um, do the imaging without any staining using the intrinsic you know, reflectance um, signatures of the tissues. And the imaging principle of all uh, and the microscope is reflectance. So the light gets reflected, is it, fl is it fluorescent light or reflected light, but it's light reflected from the surface. We don't slice the tissue. For some example of ex vivo bench uh, top systems, the system called Muse, which use very narrow band light and it's just reflected from the surface. And you can see this nice picture of bacteria on the some fibrous material. Uh, there is a picture from our paper where we use the benchtop confocal reflectance microscopy with different stains to have these beautiful images which are very similar to regular H&E. Uh, there's a Raman technology which uses Raman phenomena to get the basically the Raman spectra of the tissue, different molecules like SH2, SH3, then subtract these channels and basically differentiate nuclei and the cytoplasm. What about the endomicroscope? There are several systems uh, like Endomac. There's one paper about this system by Carl Zeiss. Um, uh, sorry, stores. So the big microscope, you can get this kind of black and white images of the cells in the culture. And this is a gray, gray matter of the pig. There's also a dual axis scanning confocal and laser endomicroscope. You can see there's a handheld probe 
there's a excited excitation light and um, detection of the emitted light going to different pathways. This is work by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I think Lou from Dr. Va uh, from University of Washington. It's a big group there. They work with the barrow. They also got decent pictures, um, and they can scan uh, relatively faster. And then there's new technologies, second and third harmonic generation, which use intrinsic signals from the tissue. I don't, I don't want to go into the details, but basically you have a, a long optics like a regular uh, endoscope. Uh, it's a relatively long optics, which allows to bring the, uh, you know, all the intrinsic, um, you know, um, capabilities of the confocal microscope. And then basically, instead of the objective, you have very long objective, like an, uh, an endoscope. And you can bring this uh, imaging deeper into the tissue. Um, so uh, then one of the neural system is Convivo from Zeiss, the system that we have been working on. This is the imaging probe, handheld probe that you hold um, in your arms during the surgery, which we did in research. And uh, I'm not going to talk about Silvizio, Dr. Charlambaki. Uh, I think you're going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, so what are the differences? The differences are an excitation laser. Some systems use 488 laser, which is compatible with fluorescein. Some systems use um, a near infrared spectrum. I think uh, Silvizio has near infrared system right now. Then the difference in the field of view, usually the field of view is small about half millimeter or even smaller. And then uh, the difference is the speed of the imaging. The higher the speed, the more video frame, the um, kind of the more appealing the picture, but then the quality it degrades a little bit. Uh, and then the lower the speed, the higher the quality, the more exposure time you have to reconstruct a good image. So we're gonna discuss it. So then, want to talk about the fluorescein when describe the fluorescein molecule. So basically what it is, is the systemic drug that you inject that does about two to five milligrams per kilo to humans. This is the animal brain and just shows the highlightment of the tumor by the fluorescein. This is how it works. Is that all technology? Uh, first uh, described by Dr. Moore in uh, I think beginning of the 20th century, but at that time they did not have uh, sophisticated optics for the microscope. They just use the natural color, the yellow color of the fluorescein. Right now with the optics of the microscope, we can excite more effectively and we can visualize more effectively like this um, yellow light. Uh, fluorescein can be administered at high doses and you can see it in naked eye, it's yellow, or low doses. Naked eye, you don't see it, but if you excite it with appropriate light, you start to see it. It clears easily within 24 hours, and how does it work? In order to understand how all the fluorophores work, we need to look at the broad brain barrier. This is a recent paper we published about the how fluorophores get to the brain, how they get excite, uh, you know, the tumors and so on. So here you have the basement membrane. Uh, you have the epithelial sites. You have the, you know, um, the astrocyte food processes. And this is the tight junction. In the tumor, the tight junction are disrupted. And this is a scale to scale molecule of albumin. Here's the little bit enlarged. And uh, this is the relative scale of fluorescein molecule. This relative uh, size of the 5LA molecule, even smaller, relative size of the ICG molecule, you probably know about it. And some of the new molecules used for in the research like BLZ, some nanoparticles, um, exosomes, quantum dots, um, sodium fluorescein ICG nanoparticles and all lots of them. So fluorescein, how does it interact with the cells? It diffuses from the leaked uh, leakage uh, of the blood brain barrier within the tumor in the extracellular space. And there are some transporter that non, uh, non specifically take the tumor, uh, take the fluorescein in and then uh, also, uh, you know, secrete it out. Uh, 5LA has very sophisticated metabolism. 5LA gets inside the cells and the mitochondria gets converted to fluorescent protoporphyrin due to some of the blockage of the downstream pathways. And then protoporphyrin accumulates in the cells and then it goes sometimes out of the cell, sometimes it's most, but mostly it's accumulated inside the cells. And then ICG, you probably know about it. 
mostly bound to the albumin and also leaks with a um, degraded blood brain barrier. So the behavior is very similar to fluorescein, but we're going to stick with fluorescein. So when you inject fluorescein, I'm going to talk about how the image uh, is formed. So in the regular H and E image, first we dip the specimen in the allosine and it stains the cytoplasm um, of the cells, uh, bright um, rose. And then we dip it to the hematoxylin and it stains the nuclei of the cells blue. And so this is how we uh, form the image. Confocal image formed differently. So we inject the uh, dye intravascularly and it diffuses in the extravascular space. So you have the highlightment and outline, um, the contours of the cells get outlined for you. And then with time, fluorescein diffuses inside the cells through the membranes. And as many, as much membranes you have, the, uh, the more difficult the fluorescein to pass through. So you have this gradient of diffusion. So on the most left, you have like a non-stained tissue. You, don't, you, don't, you can't see the cells. This is how the H and E works. And this is how the staining, uh, in vivo staining works non-specific staining with fluorescein. And uh, this is the, um, um, how the yellow F60 works, the microscope, new uh, kind of uh, microscope for the visual, visualization of fluorescein in the white field image. So basically excite uh, with the white uh, spectrum illumination device in the kind of two bands in red and blue and green. And then you have additional band formed here, it's a fluorescent band, which gets balanced by the emission filter. Uh, you cut a little bit of excitation light, you allow all the emis emitted light to pass through. And then this actually fluorescent spectrum pass within the limits of the human eye. So you can see the oculars of the microscope. So we just published the paper uh, showing the new advancement with the optics, which allows you to see better um, colors like uh, you see it here in the kineo is more realistic colors than the previous generation of the microscopes. Um, so basically allows you to see fluores flu fluorescence and the normal brain better. But Dr. Shalampak, you're gonna talk about even more advanced technology. Uh, so interpretation, how do we interpret confocal imaging? First of all, um, the bleeding. We have a lot of artifacts of red blood cells. This is different, definitely an issue. So you see lots of small cells here moving. It's all blood, it's all red blood cells. It's an issue. Another thing to consider is the probe size. So basically when you put the probe against the tissue, you have very small actually the window that you're actually um, probing. So the actual size of the probe, imagine if this is four millimeters, the actual imaging window windows are just quarter by half millimeter. You need to take it into account. Another thing to pay attention is the movement. I feel personally it's more easy to, um, you know, interpret images that have movement on it. Here's static image, you can't make a sense. What is this? What is that? What does it all mean? But if you start uh, add movements, you can see, oh, this is probably a blood clot. This is all the movement of the red blood cells. And this is probably amorphous material. Nothing moves here. And this is indeed was normal brain. You don't see any tumor cells here. No tumor cells visible. So can we distinguish cell compartments? We did the study when we used two uh, stains, one specific nuclear staining, and we uh, measured the nuclear sizes. And then we used the fluorescein staining, and we also kind of guessed the nuclear sizes and the uh, cytoplasm sizes in the cells. And we figure out that we actually get the nuclear sizes uh, right. So the average size guessed by this type of image and the specific staining was about the same. There was no difference. With fluorescent reaction, I can actually differentiate the, the cells, uh, the nuclei, and the cytoplasm. This is the example of confocal images. What type of images can you see? But how to interpret them? So first you look at the cell sizes. You see this small uh, moving cell, this is a red blood cell, the classic red blood cells. Look at this huge homongous cells with huge um, nucleus. So, and this big nucleus, this, all this small, uh, not small, large uh, round cells that are all probably nuclei of cells and uh, cell cytoplasm here. So these are all example of the tumor cells that are easily visualized and pathologists would call them away right away. It's a little bit different for us for neurosurgeon to learn a neuropathology and specifically this uh, in vivo pathology. So 
uh, we believe that coordination collaboration with neuropathologists is paramount importance. So here you see very small uh, dots, looks like it's all red blood cells. And on the right side, you can see um, just popping up kind of large cells, which are abnormal. You don't have this large cells in the normal brain, except for the proboscerebellum, the giant cells. So what you can do with the confocal images, we can take the Z stacks and you can rotate, you can pseudo color them. A um, few examples, this is a patient with intraventricular mass and uh, I want to show you this image. Um, this was a clearly um, diagnostic image of the tumor mass. Um, so uh, the cells are arranged around, uh, aligned around the basement membrane. You can see they like aligned here, here, which is very correlative with the, uh, sorry, let me just post create some of the applications. Um, images. This is an example of the one of the um, metastases. Actually, you can see some of the cells took up fluorescein. They highlight the cytoplasm is highlighted, and uh, so it was actually very amazing. You can see the cells during the surgery. This, this is amazing. So protocol that we used uh, for this imaging is pretty simple, but uh, it has some in, um, details in it. So previously, when this we just started investigating this kind of focal imaging, the white field fluorescence was not available uh, yet. So we were injecting fluorescein right before the kind of focal biopsy. So uh, in the, it was, the work was done at Barrow Neurological Institute. And so then we got a nice CLA biopsies. But now we also have white fluorescence with fluorescein and people are interested in using it uh, together. So they would use fluorescein together with the white fluorescence uh, mode. Um, and then as an additional uh, tool to use the confocal image, and that creates some problems because the time passed uh, since the administration of fluorescein degrades the contrast and my need to, the contrast need to be re-injected for specifically for the biopsy. Uh, these are uh, two recent paper published by just uh, less than a month ago, but two groups independently, one of uh, our group from the Barrow, and then the Italian group, uh, Dr. Acerbi, about the same system. So uh, in our uh, work, uh, we had um, 47 patients with 122 biopsies. They had 15 patients. Uh, sorry. Just a patient takes too much space. Um, and then we showed that actually gliomas and carcinomas were all had very high specificity. So if we see something abnormal, it's most likely abnormal with the stool. Uh, and positive predictive value is very high. The sensitivity is lower because there are some um, areas that are doubtful, and mostly the normal brain. And these are some examples. So, so um, most of the normal brain looks dark because there's no fluorescence there. There's some out, out of fluorescence speckles around. There is uh, when the, there is dense out of fluorescence and patch out of fluorescence, it might be uh, representative of like invasion or um, transition between the abnormal uh, tumor with the disrupted blood brain barrier, the normal, uh, normal brain. Most of the tumor look um, bright, hypercellular with large, big cells visualized and very diagnostic. And uh, we show that um, like gliomas are very highly diagnostic based on these criteria, like architecture, cell morphology, typical cells, hypocellular. You can all see this in these images. This is another example of recurrent GBM. Uh, the sodium fluorescein was administered in one and a half hours. The biopsy was dark. So then we re-administered and we saw uh, large abnormal cells. Here, the all dark um, nuclei with all membranes. Another example, another GBM. And you see this big uh, nuclei, the dark round cells. These are all nuclei uh, probably of the tumor cells. They're much larger than the erythrocytes. You probably can see like small erythrocytes here, here, probably one of them right here, right here. So these are abnormal large cells. Uh, so Italian group uh, from Dr. Cherby from Milan, 
he got about uh, similar results. The um, tumor imaging with uh, Convivo was diagnosed about 73%. They were able to see necrosis about uh, two thirds of the cases and they will also see vascular proliferation and so on. It, they also had very high concordance um, with the images, basically 80% of the image, and it was done ex vivo analysis. So in vivo should be better. And then they used the long time of the imaging. So time from the sampling to convivo is basically uh, since uh, time from taking the biopsy to imaging about 20 minutes. And interpretation time was actually under five minutes. So imagine uh, instead of waiting an hour or, or sometimes uh, several days to wait for the pathology results, you can get the results sooner by five minutes. So uh, this is just uh, an overview, the introduction, and hopefully you'll enjoy Dr. Chalampaki's lecture. Uh, she's going to talk more about the clinical details of confocal imaging, but um, I hope. Uh, that from this lecture, you um, learn and understood the, how the fluorescence work, how the confocal imaging works. And this is just some concluding slides um, and concluding statements about this, that this technology is promising, but it's still in the early stage of development. There are more uh, cool stuff coming up and that current thing needs validation. There are in vivo studies that are underway right now. And there we need more data for pathology and neurosurgery education. I think one of these webinars would be a good avenue to uh, introduce this technology to a broader audience. And uh, then this technology also has the potential uh, for telepathology, like we all see each other together right now. We can share the data of pathology, like we share our intraoperative videos. The pathologists could share this, uh, the films and we can do it all intraoperatively. Um, so with this, I want to thank, thanks, uh, thank all the collaborators on this project uh, from Barron Neurological Institute, from University of Washington. Um, one of the professors, Bessler Nakaji, Dr. Ejbacher, she's a neuropathologist in Barrow. Dr. Lawton, current uh, director and one of the, and the researchers and uh, also sponsors. Uh, most of this work was done at Barrow Neurological Institute and uh, some of them was sponsored uh, the um, provided the imaging tools provided by Carl Zeiss. Uh, with, then, with this, I thank you everyone and I'll um, open for the question. Thank you very much, uh, Evgeny. So we will keep the question uh, at the end of the presentation. So well done, very nice presentation. You covered the very basic fundamental, it is a translation research from a laboratory and bring to the theater and how we can help uh, for a surgeon, uh, especially uh, in doing a brain tumor surgery using this optical imaging. So we will keep the question uh, later. So now it is my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Cleopatra Sharalampaki. She was born in Greece and received her basic medical degree in medicine from University of Cologne, Germany in 1996. She obtained her PhD degree from the Medical University of Graz, Austria in 2008 and her professorship in the University of Düsseldorf in 2014. She was actively participate and involved in many research uh, and in many publications. And she is one of the important co-workers of uh, the late Professor Asa Penesky where she spent almost eight years from 2000 to 2008 working in Department of Neurosurgery uh, Mines in Germany, where I had the opportunity to visit the center for one year in 2004 and 2005. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and pleasure to invite uh, Professor Cleopatra Sharanpaki to present her topic on confocal assisted fluorescence in glioma surgery. So Cleopatra. So, um, Evgeny, you have to go out, otherwise I cannot yeah. share. Again, you have to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. Um, oh, wait.
Okay, so thank you, Azmi. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating here in this uh, webinar. I hope you enjoyed the lecture of uh, Evgeny. I am very, um, very proud of him. I know him since a few years now. He is a resident. Um, so uh, this is a very nice example to see that uh, also young neurosurgeons uh, can make a very uh, good uh, research work, right? So um, I want to focus my lecture in uh, two kinds of technologies. What uh, the one is um, coming more from the daily routine, what, uh, what we uh, uh, use, um, uh, the, the fluorescent uh, part in uh, surgery and uh, then uh, go to the direction of confocal microscopy and uh, uh, give a few um, um, impressions about our work here in Cologne in the last 10 years and the focus what we um, will uh, give in uh, the future. So, um, first of all, um, a few important points, uh, what is the state of the art in, uh, in uh, fluorescent uh, surgery today? Um, in a lot of countries, I think uh, in the meantime, 5-ALA is approved. So um, the glioma surgery is uh, more focused on uh, tumor resection under 5-ALA. Um, what is 5-ALA and uh, how it interacts with uh, the microscopes? Um, it's an interchange, that it's a spectral interchange um, between white light and uh, fluorescent filters. So um, if you turn from the white light to, um, to the blue light, then you can see this uh, beautiful, but very dark um, images, uh, like you see it here in the videos. Um, so in my opinion, and I think it's, uh, I'm not alone with this opinion, uh, a lot of surgeons say this, uh, there are three serious problems. What we identify, um, the first is the dark view, of course. Um, the second is uh, that if uh, glioma starts to bleed, that uh, then fluorescence is not visible anymore. And the third is the ergonomy. And the ergonomy is, um, why is ergonomy an issue? Because you have to bring your hand out of, um, of the, the operation field and then switch back and forth between the white and uh, the blue light. So uh, this, what we did, um, we, we create a software what is um, introduced in a surgical microscope. Um, and uh, we are able now with the help of augmented reality in a real time fashion um, to overlap the fluorescence uh, view together with a white light and then create an artificial um, or let's say an augmented uh, reality view um, above the tumor like you see it here you see here the blue uh, lights uh, this blue light um, it could be a red light it could be green light um, so here you you saw um, the switch um, and uh, the surgeons uh, have the feeling that um, they see a green tumor. So um, the good thing uh, with this technology is that um, the white light is not going away. Um, you don't have to switch back and forth. You can operate um, the whole surgery during the whole surgery with uh, this kind of... Um, uh, module um, and uh, you can see also 
uh, during uh, the fluorescence uh, surgery, you can see also the normal brain. Um, so the normal brain is not uh, going away like uh, you see it here. You see here that the normal brain, uh, what, what the surgeons have to protect, by the way, um, here is very dark. So the focus with this new technology is to uh, um, overcome this problem and to have something uh, like this, where you can see very well the fluorescence. You can see that now blood is coming. It covers the fluorescent, um, the fluorescence here. But um, if you go and suck the blood away, then um, you see the fluorescence again. And you don't miss um, the white light uh, information. Here is um, the same metastasis. It's a metastasis, by the way, and everyone who uh, operates um, uh, pathologies like this knows also the problem what those pathologies has. Um, you go in here via a temporal approach and then you puncture here and then the brain collapses. Uh, so it's very, very difficult here to see um, the borders, but if you have a technology like this, then um, this uh, area, what uh, reflects the fluorescence is um, the analog area here, what is uh, contrast enhanced on the MRI scan. So you are able um, then to have um, here on the right um, a site of, of the slice, you can see the postoperative um, MRI scans where you can see that everything what, um, what enhanced um, contrast agent is it's gone. Um, here is uh, another example where I would like to demonstrate um, that this technology is able to uh, be in combination with different channels and with different contrast agents. What we have, this is um, the 5 ALA channel. And this is the ICG channel where you can see here um, parts of the PICA uh, with um, ICG floating. And here you can see the ependymoma. This is, by the way, the same uh, patient, the same surgery. The ependymoma here in the fourth ventricle um, with uh, highlighted with five ala um, and uh, here covered with, uh, uh, with this new technology uh, via uh, the microscope, um, the augmented reality uh, microscope. So um, in the future, the next step is to combine it. So you can um, have a surgery where you can have here different colors um, in um, showing you, every color will show you um, another, um, another contrast agent. So um, the one, five ALA, the, the other, um, for example, fluorescein and the third one, ICG. So we call uh, this uh, multicolor, multispectral imaging. Um, but this is on the way. We are now um, under investigation to put both together. Um, but even though um, with fluorescence, uh, the problem uh, is that you don't have identification on a, on a minimal scale. So uh, what does this mean? This means that um, a solution like this, it would be uh, perfect. So this is a picture where it shows that it could be possible in the future to, uh, to have a microscope what um, shows you fluorescence and also via the tip um, of, um, of a handheld device um, to be able then to analyze uh, this area where, for example, fluorescence is very low, um, what kind of cells uh, this area is showing you. 
So um, I think I will skip this because Evgeny was uh, told about the introduction of confocal laser microscopy. So I will say a few um, a few thoughts uh, when I start with confocal microscopy, why I start and in which direction I plan to go. So we start here in my lab, um, I think approximately over 12 uh, years ago. Um, and the goals was, first of all, to be able to perform in vivo diagnosis um, and uh, histo histopathology. Then the second, and I think this is the most, the mo most important step for uh, surgeons, to be able to extend the intraoperative resection uh, accuracy. And uh, the third part was to combine um, light reflectance techniques uh, with approved biomarkers. So um, be able then to perform targeted uh, tumor therapy. Um, so we, we move in um, not with um, OptiScan, with the OptiScan technology. I was working in the beginning with the OptiScan technology, but um, I was a little bit uh, skeptical about um, the, the, um, the fluoresce, fluorescence, the fluorescein fluorescence and the negative parts what uh, it has. And uh, the other thing was, of course, um, that you was not exactly able to see only the cell. And this was um, the thing why I start to work with uh, Mauna Kea and uh, with, a, with a, a ICG, um, because with ICG, then it was, um, I was able to go intraoperatively deeper um, and also on the scale of 800 nanometers, blood is not visible anymore for the endoscope. So uh, this problem, what Evgeny shows, um, that you have artifacts and you see uh, blood. Um, and so it was um, from, from the nature of uh, the physics, it was um, suddenly solved um, only with going in another spectral range. Um, but uh, it, it was still disadvantages. What the system uh, has was, of course, first, you have to go in contact with a tissue. Um, so uh, in the direction of um, became a class three uh, approval for a product for bringing it into uh, surgery, it's very, very um, difficult to become it. And the second was that um, ICG is still a, a non-specific fluorescent agent. So um, this means that you was depend of, um, of an agent um, and also that uh, the field of view was uh, very narrow. Okay, I will come for solution how we how we solve these problems a little bit later on i want to show you here a few things um regarding uh um my my intraoperative uh, use of icg and uh, you can see it here on a low grade astrocytoma uh, low grade astrocytoma they are very very difficult to uh, uh, operate because um you don't have not so many tools where you can show you uh, exactly the, um, the borders. So um, here it was very nice to see that confocal microscopy was uh, helpful to identify a uh, tumor area. So you can see here the confocal um, picture and also the histology. Then after the tumor resection, what we did with uh, the help of um, the state of the art uh, things like navigation and ultrasound and so to see um, to see an area like this where you can see here a very very clear border between normal tissue and tumor tissue 
and um, a picture like this, for example, it's it's not possible to have it with with another kind of of technology. Then here, um, this is from the area of uh, resection, where you can see here very nice astrocytes and uh, different kind of uh, cell structures, and uh, you see here um, also the. Uh, the advantage um, of ICG that it goes into the cytoplasm and it highlights the cytoplasm. So you have here two positive effects. The one is that you see only the cell um, and you, you can see also from the negative um, point of view, you can see also the nucleus of the cell because if you highlight the cytoplasm, then the nucleus remains of course, uh, black. So you can have here also um, a subcellular uh, analysis of uh, different kind of uh, structures. Um, so here you can see again um, this uh, analysis. So you you are able with a technology um, to see here the tumor to see borders are very good and to see also the field of uh, resection. Another thing what I uh, wanted to see um, here, and uh, that's why I operate this meningioma, also using uh, confocal uh, microscopy, was not um, to see how the meningioma is looking, but to see the optic nerve and how the optic nerve and how you can distinguish the optic nerve from the tumor because um, every one of you who do um, uh, neurosurgery for children, you know that we have in neurosurgery the glioma uh, of the optic nerve. What is, there is no, no therapy, no surgical therapy and also no therapy uh, otherwise uh, for this kind of, of tumor. And, the children's they they became blind at the end so um i was very curious here to see if you can have uh for future um for future investigation uh the the possibility to to um, have a clear border between the optic fibers and the tumor yeah uh, I was not, not caring about um, meningioma and how it looks, but uh, much more focused on the optic nerve. And you see here the relation uh, via the endoscope, the relation between the optic nerve and the tumor. So um, I was um, able then via the endoscope to introduce uh, the fiber here and uh, then stabilize the fiber um, here is hand, hand with a hand. I stabilized it with a hand. This was, by the way, a supraorbital uh, approach here. You see here the optic uh, part, the optic nerve, and here um, the tumor. So you can switch between um, to focus the, the, the probe on, on the optic nerve and also on the tumor, but also in between. Um, and so here, by this case, um, I did um, um, a combination um, endoscopic microscopic uh, approach. And here, here you can see the meningioma um, confocal microscopy. So here, um, very typical depsamoma bodies. Here also, here this uh, small um, black um, parts of, of uh, the tumor. They are very typical for histology of the meningioma. Um, and also this kind of uh, small cells and uh, the fibers in between. And after we, um, we saw with the uh, with conf the confocal probe, um, different parts of uh, the meningioma, we switch um, then on um, to see the uh, optic nerve. We try here also to see the borders, but it was it was not 
not so good um, uh, visible, um, we could come from the tumor site um, into um, into the um, into the optic into the optic nerve uh, side, but um, because of the stabilization of the probe, it was a little bit difficult to see the the, the part um, of this. Here, we try then to focus on the optic nerve. Um, here was the optic nerve. This was after the resection of um, the tumor. And uh, we could see um, then with the confocal probe. The confocal probe is, by the way, 2.4 uh, millimeter. Is, um, it's a, a very good fit in into a working channel of the classic endoscopes. Um, so the optic fibers, um, you can see it here very well. It was uh, possible to see it in the horizontal plane, but also in the vertical plane. So um, here you see it uh, on a parallel fashion um, coming. And it's very, um, very good uh, here to um, to uh, uh, follow also the, um, the optic nerve. And here in this video, you can see it in the transversal uh, fashion. You can see here everywhere uh, the um, uh, oligodendroglia um, here, what all together uh, makes, um, of course, the, um, the optic uh, fibers with the, the, the optic nerve. Um, another indication what we uh, also um, use uh, and um, this uh, here, um, it was an intraspinal meningioma, but again, I don't focus, I didn't focus on the meningioma, but I focus on the spinal cord to see the spinal cord, how um, if you can maybe uh, later on use uh, light and uh, light techniques um, for repair something in the spinal cord. Uh, to be honest, I, at, in this moment, I don't have an idea how exactly, but um, it's good to see that um, you, can, <laughs> you can see uh, the cellular level of uh, the spinal cord intraoperatively. So the focus here was, um, again, to use um, confocal laser endomicroscopy with um, ICG. Um, and you see here, this is the ICG. We gave it uh, topically. Um, and it's uh, very, very few drops. Uh, it's, it was enough. So you don't need uh, um, big amounts of, um, of um, of the contrast agent. So um, before we uh, resect the meningioma, we uh, take a look. Um, so we uh, try to have uh, here intraoperative the systems, um, not as a picture in picture with a microscope, but um, for having the whole information available, we um, had both in the OR. So you see here again, the confocal probe and um, you see it here. This is the tumor and um, here is the spinal cord. Um, I um, start to reject a little bit of the tumor and then I stopped and um, I wanted to then first to see the meningioma. You see, you can see here very classic um, depsamoma bodies. Um, here the black uh, big holes. Um, and then um, here also very nice. Um, it's very typical for uh, meningiomas, for the histology of the menin meningiomas. So here is the H and E uh, staining, where here again you can see the psamoma bodies, and uh, here in the confocal view. And uh, here I tried to see 
um, and to come from the tumor site um, into uh, the healthy tissue. Um, so I put the probe um, in between. So um, in, and I was hoping uh, to get pictures uh, where you see and you come from the tumor to the healthy tissue and it was, um, it was indeed so that um, you, you saw a transition zone. So this is the transition zone. So you see here, not exactly the healthy tissue, but the tissue of uh, the spinal cord uh, where the tumor was pressed. So was, was lying off um, and here um, again you come from from uh, the heel the the pressed uh, spinal cord and this here for example is two more is uh, there are two more pieces lying above of uh, the spinal cord where you can see here very well that the two more pieces they are moving um, here again and here another one And here you have um, full um, in the full uh, the tumor. So after the tumor resection, we uh, um, so here I resect the tumor as a normal manner, how neurosurgeons are doing everywhere. So uh, we we try to resect it. Um, here and this this was uh, finished. So we uh, take again uh, the the probe and put it above um, of parts of um, of the spinal cord. And you see here um, the spinal cord very nice. Here the neurons uh, parallel on this parallel uh, manner. And here this uh, big black. Um, Think what you can see here is a vessel, is a capillar. Um, we have here a uh, um, resolution of uh, a few microns, so two to three microns. So um, the resolution is uh, very high and also the magnification is uh, something between um, eight and uh, 1,000. Um, here again, this is a vessel here and um, the neurons what's uh, coming here on a parallel um, fashion here uh, to cross the, the spinal cord. So we move um, along to uh, the spinal cord and you see as long as you moved outside of um, of the pressed uh, spinal cord, you see much more parallel structures here and parallel nerves, uh, uh, nerve fibers, neurons um, was uh, located. So, but even though um, intraoperative CLE with ICG has a few advantages to fluorescein and uh, five ALA, but uh, still there was a few disadvantages. So the first disadvantage was, as I told you before, the contact with the tissue and then of course, still fluorescent agent uh, was needed. So after 10 years of experience with CLE a few years ago, it was uh, 2017 to 2018, um, I was uh, making a, a brainstorming with my team and uh, and parallel, um, we were introduced to, um, to a team in, um, in Oxford University where they have a very, um, a very nice technique to um, equip uh, confocal microscopes for biology to uh, first of all, to going much more deeper in the tissue and uh, the second one was that they were able to, um, to create confocal microscopes without uh, coming in touch with, um, 
with the tissue. So um, I was taking uh, the aeroplane flying to Oxford and uh, I make a deal to create a European uh, project with uh, the guys. And we got it. Uh, we got uh, the approval from the European Union. So we uh, um, create uh, the first contactless and also label free uh, designed microscope. Uh, what is uh, very, very small, as a relatively small. And um, you can, you can uh, have it also here with a, a looking like an endoscope. Um, and you see here that you don't need to come in contact with a tissue, but um, to be in um, a few centimeters uh, away from the tissue. Um, so I will, this uh, microscope is also uh, not working with contrast agents. So this, what I will show you is now with pure light reflectancy. Uh, and you can see here the human pyramid tract. This is on a um, cadaveric slice. And you can see here, even without um, the using of, um, of uh, agents and also um, not in coming contact with um, with a tissue, you can have here very nice um, pictures. And uh, you have to keep in mind that all this what you saw is not have nothing to do with navigation. This is all real time imaging. So, um, and this is a big big uh, advantage if you can be able um, during two or three hours uh, during the surgery to have a real time um, tool um, and to be independent from, um, from big um, uh, devices or very expensive devices like MRI scans, like navigations, like uh, things like this because this is also a, um, one of my, my biggest targets uh, in the developing of these techniques, um, to bring techniques what are small, what are approachable, what are um, easy to use uh, for the daily routine for the surgeons. And um, of course we, we, um, we are not, not stopping here um, this what we uh, want also to achieve is um, to uh, bring uh, to neurosurgeons um, deep machine learning algorithms also in these tools uh, in for helping them uh, to make the decisions what a kind of cell is this or what a kind of cell is this um, to make it much more uh, easily. Uh, so I am uh, also working parallel with engineers in uh, artificial intelligence and in deep machine learning algorithms for making intelligent machines and not, not only to have an optic tool and then to let uh, the neurosurgeon in his own destiny uh, to decide what is this for a cell, yeah? Um, and I think um, this new decade uh, is the decade of artificial intelligence. Um, and um, here um, are in the last slide a few points uh, where I think um, this kind of technologies can go. So in vivo diagnosis, automatized recognized tissue modalities, uh, definition of borders, a uh, further increase of extend intraoperative resection, what was always the desire of uh, my personal mentor, Professor Pernetsky. And um, also that uh, you can, those kind of, um, of um, technologies uh, um, to take the nucleus of these technologies and to involve it in, in different, um, instruments what we have in the operation uh, theater um, and then create uh, a machine what is maybe 
not called microscope or endoscope anymore, but um, a machine what is an intelligent assistant for uh, the surgeon, uh, starting with uh, integration of uh, the packs uh, and of the MRI scans, um, going into an intelligent navigation machine, an optic machine, and uh, of course, a um, chemical analyzer in uh, during the surgery. And um, yeah, with those few words, I want to thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Asmi. And um, I think we can uh, open the discussion around. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Cleo. Very nice, very uh, interesting and amazing. So we start with uh, basic, uh, uh, fundamental. Then you talk about fluorescent. Then you talk about contact uh, endoscopy. Then we move to contactless endoscopy and now moving to uh, integration with the artificial intelligence. Excellent presentation by both speaker. <laughs> so uh, it's a very, very, very good. So now we open the discussion. So I would like to invite a few panelists, uh, which is we have uh, one, Professor Alberto Felletti. He's from uh, University of Verona, Italy. And we also have, I think, Professor Jeffrey Malin. Uh, if you can uh, put yourself on video. So we will start with the question from the panelists. And we have also a few questions from the check box. So maybe uh, Alberto. Uh, can you start uh, the ball rolling? Yeah, thank you, Asmi. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank both uh, uh, panelists, uh, both the speakers, uh, because I really enjoyed uh, their presentations. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, I have uh, I have had some experience with confocal uh, with the ex vivo uh, application, but I have no experience with in vivo use which is probably the most fascinating side of this, of this technology. I have some questions uh, uh, for, for our speakers. Uh, some of them are very practical. For example, uh, Professor Charadampaki mentioned this limitation probably. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this confocal works uh, uh, at a submillimetric scale but our surgical fields are much bigger. So yeah. how to manage this mismatch? Because I guess if you want to check all your uh, areas in your field, yeah. it will take forever, right? So the impact yes. on surgical yes. timing uh, can be very important, right? So yes. uh, how do you manage your cases in such cases? Do you like uh, sample uh, some areas, just some areas of the surgical field? This is my first question. Second question is, who does the interpretation of intraoperative data? Neurosurgeon or is there a pathologist, an experienced pathologist uh, in the OR who can interpret? And if is the neurosurgeon who does mm. this job, uh, does the neurosurgeon require a specific training? And uh, how, how long is the learning curve? Mm. Okay, so um, the first question, uh, <laughs> it's not only a question, it was always from the beginning of, uh, um, of this, uh, um, yeah, of this journey, because it's a journey, I am now 12 years in, in this journey. Um, this was the first question also in my mind, how you can uh, bring this two totally different dimensions uh, together. Um, so I think, and that's why at the end of my journey, I switched to, uh, to, to contactless because um, contactless, it means not only that you don't come in con contact with the tissue, but as, as long or as as far away you come from the tissue, um, then more bigger your field of view become. So um, we, uh, we have now a prototype what is um, able to see um, from the first view to see uh, approximately 
700, um, no, seven uh, millimeters. So seven to eight millimeters. So if you, if you know that your field of view is approximately a few centimeters and you, you, um, you need then with a tool like this to make three to four scans, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I came with this, with this switch of from contact to contactless um, immediately in a scale of uh, more 10,000 microns or, or yeah, in, in from one day to the other. Um, this is the first. The, the second thing is that... Um, I, I, I understand. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you uh, about yeah. this, this point. Uh, don't you feel that uh, this technique, like uh, in, um, increasing the distance of the probe from the tissue, so widening your, your uh, field, yeah. lowers uh, specificity or sensibility of the... No, no, the no, no. Um, the... the um, um, the um, specificity of uh, the pictures uh, remains the same, and um, this what uh, what what was here. Uh, the good thing is that um, we uh, we move into near infrared and infrared. So as 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 much. Um, you go above uh, in the spectral range, um, then more uh, information you can get from the tissue. Um, and uh, another thing was, of course, that um, I use these technologies in, in this moment, yeah, um, with a combination, in a combination with, um, uh, with the macro fluorescence. Yeah, what I, I show you in, in the beginning of the lecture. Um, so I don't use confocal microscope from the beginning. Yeah, because it, it makes no sense. Um, I think uh, the most uh, biggest sense what it makes this technology is for the, ma the, the margins. Um, the second thing, uh, what the second question, uh, um, what you have with uh, experience and and uh, and so on, and who interprets? At the beginning, to be honest, I interpreted, and I was uh, reading books and uh, see and uh, Google and have the iPhone in the OR. Um, because it was running this development so fast that uh, I couldn't get uh, an, a neuropathologist in. But then, after our first publication, um, I came in contact with a very good uh, neuropathologist here in uh, Germany, in uh, Munich. So we start to cooperate together with Jürgen Schlegel. He's from uh, the Technical University in Munich. And he found uh, this very um, attractive, also from the neuropathological uh, side of view, um, because you know that neuropathology is switching much more in molecular pathology. So they don't want to waste their time with optical imaging. So if they can put the optical imaging into an integration into the operation field, yeah, and, uh, and give it to the neurosurgeon or give it to an intelligent algorithm machine, uh, then they would be very happy because then they have, um, they, they can be uh, via an internet connection uh, into the operation field together with a neurosurgeon, because if you create um, a machine like this, what I, what I said on the end of my lecture, then of course this machine is based on internet. So they, they can um, be anytime uh, they are able to see via their, uh, at least via their iPhone uh, to see what you are operating uh, on a cellular level and to interpret this. Another um, thing, um, and that's why we 
we move on and make the step to cooperate with uh, engineers with for deep machine learning was that uh, you don't have um, uh, anywhere and uh, and everywhere and 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 every time available a neuropathologist. So uh, I think um, to create also uh, intelligent algorithms is uh, not so a bad idea. And uh, that's why we move um, 2013 to 14 and we have a nice cooperation with Princeton University and uh, Siemens and we create um, also mathematical algorithm. Now I am also working uh, still with uh, Imperial College in London with the Hamlin Center of Robotics. They have there a very nice um, institution uh, for uh, deep machine learning and uh, in combination with visualization techniques. Um, and um, yeah, I am uh, on the way in, the, in this uh, direction because I, I don't want to bother neurosurgeons uh, with, with, with new interpretations. You know, I am, I am myself 25 years in neurosurgery and I know that uh, we are focusing on this, what we see. Uh, and and um, it's very, yeah, it's it's very heavy to to uh, to to see uh, and uh, to have them bleeding there and uh, to coagulate and to um, to have the anatomical structures coming and differentiate, and then uh, suddenly it comes a new technology and you have also to be a neuropathologist. And I don't want this. I want to help more and, and not to. Yeah, so I think first um, we can introduce a technology like this in a smooth way into the neurosurgical workflow coming from uh, fluorescence into uh, augmented reality fluorescence into uh, confocal in combination and then later on, if the confocal microscopes uh, can become uh, an, an intelligent tool, what can switch, for example, from 10 time magnification suddenly to 50, 100, 400 magnification in one tool, then it's done. Now, this is the, um, the road. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much for a very nice explanation. Now, I would like to invite Prof. Jaffrey Malin uh, from the University of uh, UMC Science Malaysia uh, to give his comment or uh, maybe uh, introduce some question. Prof. Jaffrey? Yeah, I guess. Thank you very much, Asmi. Uh, Cleopatra, very interesting talk and the first speaker as well. I would like your ideas uh, using the uh, fluorescent dye and also the contact, uh, non-contact confocal uh, you know, when you want to put wafers into a, cav a cavity, a glioma cavity, and you want those wafers to have a good contact with the residual tumors, if there are any mm -hmm. left, seen by the confocal. Uh, have you thought whether that is possible? That's the first question. Um, second question is, I would like Cleopatra to give her ideas. What are the images like of non-biological elements. For example, mm -hmm. neurosurgeons have to put in platinum or gold or uh, um, we call it carbon nanotubules onto mm -hmm. the surface of tumor of the patients who may need uh, stimulation for you know motor paralysis, etc. Uh, will the confocal images detect these uh, electrodes clearly, you know? And lastly, I would like also to ask Cleopatra, what would you think about, you know, when you want to put stem cells into mm -hmm. an area of the brain mm -hmm. uh, and you want it to arrange, you know, parallel, for example, the spinal cord or the motor cortex, do you think that the confocal will give that, that advantage so that the neurosurgeon can do that in the future? Thank you. Okay, for the first question, um, if, um, if you can detect uh, non-biological uh, probes, yes, um, you can detect it. And, uh, but um, 
the the problem i think the problem will be uh, the dimensions also it's it's depends uh, how big are this uh, non biological uh, problems because you 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 have to know that um confocal microscopes they are um they are magnify they magnify the tissue very very much so if uh, a non biological um foreign body is is big <laughs> yeah like like the wires what we use today for stimulation for deep brain stimulation for example, then um i think uh, you can you you will you will see something what you don't recognize but you can you you will miss the relation with the tissue you know um the second um ah and by the way for this first question is that um uh, there is a big uh, area um, for confocal for industry. So uh, the use of course confocal microscopes for uh, different kind of uh, industrial uh, inspections. Yeah, they are um, uh, still they they are uh, it's a, it's a very uh, big um, uh, marked market. Um, the second uh, question regarding stem cells. Um, to be honest, <laughs> I think that light has so much power where maybe you don't need stem cells for different kind of things. Maybe you can make a repair without stem cells, but only with with um, um, with light. Um, maybe with with playing of light intensities, you know, because you know the the light is coming from the sun, yeah. And what is the sun able to do? To, to make you see something, but also to destroy something. So, and also the, the, the qualities in between, uh, it's also possible, yeah? So I think that we, we know very, very low uh, things about, um, about the possibilities of the light. So, um, one thing what is very clear is that uh, you can see everything with confocal microscopy. So you can see, of course, uh, stem cells. You can see um, also the behavior of stem cells. There, there is um, a part uh, within the confocal technology uh, for biology um, what is uh, calling spinning disc uh, microscopes, uh, spinning disc microscopes, they are able to watch biological tissues for days, yeah, and to follow them for days. Um, and, um, and, and then to see the behavior of the cells in this. But I think those things, they are a little bit far away in the future, and I, by myself, I, I learned from Professor Pernetsky as a surgeon, you have to be, um, you have to be, of course, a visionary, but to stay also uh, in the borders for the next step in the vision. You know what I mean? And I think um, to, uh, to bring uh, multispectral now in and then to bring the first uh, um, cellular imaging like uh, Evgeny shows uh, in uh, um, differentiation for histomorphology and so um, is the first step. Then to grow, of course, um, um, a new generation of surgeons with this kind of technologies. Uh, you know, you cannot not come in with a new technology and then say, yeah, here, this is now uh, the new thing and you have to buy. So, yeah, it's, I think it's a change of, uh, uh, of uh, technology and change of technology is 
always also changing of mentality in the way of thinking of the surgeons, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I agree with everything Dr. Shalom Paki said. Just to want to mention one of the important points of confocal images is that it's non-destructive and it allows you to uh, obtain almost similar histological information that the neuropathologist can do with slicing the tissue without slicing it. Mm. And not even without slicing, but you can do it in vivo before taking it out. Yeah. So if yep. there are multiple, I, I have very short experience in neurosurgery compared to all of you, but even in my short experience, there's a lot of cases where you're like staring at the piece of the brain and like, how is it, do I need to take it out or not? Imagine yep. just putting the probe there like, hmm. And then the algorithm will tell you, the uh, machine will tell, okay, 70%, this is, uh, this is a tumor, 30% <laughs> looks like normal. Yeah. And then you say, yeah. oh, that's, and then you have the, um, uh, the stimulation or some uh, functional imaging uh, to see whether it's a functionally important part of the brain. And then you say, okay, probably um, safe to resect. Let's uh, rather resect yeah. than not. Because a lot of times now we have the problem that we as neurosurgeons, we think that... Um, yeah, this is a good biopsy and uh, send it away. And then yeah. it comes back, uh, sorry, oh. it's normal tissue or sorry, um, I can see here nothing. So send me again. So you lost already 30 minutes. Yeah. And then you have to lost uh, again 30 minutes. Um, but if you are connected with a neuropathologist, then he can navigate you um in the in the in the changes what he see and then to say to you listen from this part and from this part they sent me uh, the biopsy you know so it's yeah <laughs> it's time uh, uh, it's uh, it's something what is have you used it for pituitary surgery um, especially the the contact maybe the contact electrode for the uh, pituitary surgery for differentiate between a normal pituitary gland and a uh, abnormal tissue yeah i use it ex vivo not in vivo because at that time where i um i did the intraoperative study uh, <laughs> it's a shame to say it now our endoscopes they were uh, out of order and uh, here it was uh, not so easy to get another one to replace it. So it took approximately one year to replace our uh, devices here. So um, like we, Malaysia, uh, like Malaysia. Yeah, we, we, did it. <laughs> we did it with the end with a microscope. Um, the the cases so um but i took uh, samples and i uh, saw i saw um ex vivo that uh, you can you can easy um uh, see the difference between the tumor and the normal pituitary but i don't know evgeny you have you ever saw just pituitary paper. yeah we worked with two pituitary mm -hmm. surgeon dr lil and um Dr. White and Barrow, and we took also ex vivo biopsies. And it's mm. interesting, we used it with fluorescein. Mm. In wide field navigation, we were able to see the pituitary micro microstructure very well because there is no mm. blood brain barrier, so fluorescein easily diffused. So it creates a nice contrast. Um, and uh, neuropathologists were able to differentiate, but then at, uh, at some point it's easier because the fluorescein diffuser, you can see nicely the architecture, but at some point it's difficult because the pituitary is not malignant. Most, it's, if it's adenoma, it's just mul uh, the multiplication of the similar looking cells. And what neuropathologists are actually looking, uh, they stain with the uh, connective tissue. They look at the lobul uh, lobuli of the pituitary, whether they're conserved or not. So they look a little bit different. Um, 
you know, aspects and the field of view of the device can fit just a few lobules. So you actually need to scan a little bit larger area. That's what neuropathologists are doing when they're looking at pituitary samples, at least in frozen sections. Um, but uh, one important point that we learned from this study is that pituitary biopsies are sometimes such so small uh, so that uh, not using this tissue for any slicing would be beneficial. Like if you would be able to non-destructively interrogate the tissue and then send the whole samples for um, some molecular diagnostics, that would be advantageous. And then we also uh, put the probe in the cadaver tissue through the nose and we show that, oh, indeed you can, you can actually do this. So it was mm -hmm. before the time that it was probe was approved for in vivo use, but I think right now um, I'm uh, looking forward to see whether you can put the probe in some skull based approaches. <laughs> Can the, uh, the contact probe become smaller than 2.4? I don't want you down to 2.4 uh, millimeters, no? Yeah. So can it become smaller and smaller than that? Yes, it can become smaller and smaller, but uh, for surgical purposes, it makes no sense. Um, even uh, if you if you are thinking to use it for uh, stereotactic purposes, um, for, um, for making optical biopsies, uh, for example, um, via the stereotactic uh, needle, um, or uh, for deep brain stimulation, for optical stimulation, um, uh, the, the, the probe is uh, thin enough. Um, and you have to know that um, if you go and, uh, um, and create thinner and thinner the probe, then um, you low the, um, uh, the amount of optical fibers. So the resolution became much worse. Um, but it's, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, Azmi, are you there? <laughs> there are three questions from, uh, I think, listeners. Uh, the first question I'll read while waiting for Azmi. <laughs> I have a question for Prof Cleopatra in your experience with surgery using confocal scopes or probes. Have you found mm -hmm. something unexpected and have to perform certain unplanned techniques? How will you manage them? And what are your tips for us who have less experience? Second question also to Prof Cleopatra. Uh, do you feel that this instrument is more appropriate for certain histopathological lesions compared to others? I.e. this scope is better for meningiomas but not for schwannomas. Or is it all the same and histopathology does not affect the difficulty using this technique? And the third question, what mm -hmm. case subdiscipline of neurosurgery do you feel will be the least accessible mm -hmm. by confocal microendoscope? For example, is it neurofunctional cases or maybe certain neuro-oncology cases? Thank you. Mm. Okay. So... Uh... The first is, have you ever found something unexpected? Pooh, I think uh, the whole journey was, the whole journey was unexpected. unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> but from, from a positive uh, field of view was unexpected. Um, I think still, still today I am, uh, I am every day learning something new about the use of, of this. Um, normally uh, in the daily routine, uh, uh, we, uh, we, use, we, operate, we used to operate like, like all of you. Um, so uh, confocal microscopy is something what is on at the moment, yeah? At the moment, um, an additional. Uh, tool. Um, I think it's uh, it's um, 
it has to um, yeah to develop it farther for became an um, um, for became this what I told you before an an, an assistant uh, system for the surgeon. Um, for the second question, um, that this instrument is more appropriate for certain histopathological uh, compared to others. I don't think so. I think that, um, uh, by the way, meningiomas and schwannomas, they have very typical, um, very nice visible characteristics for, uh, for confocal microscopy. Um, so it was um, relatively easy to uh, characterize them. This, what is a little bit difficult is uh, to characterize the classes of gliomas. So glioma um, um, uh, one and two, the, the WHO um, types of gliomas. Um, this was a little bit more difficult. Um, but uh, in the in the um, benign tumors, it was not a problem. Um, and uh, what case and sub subdiscipline of neuro do you feel will be the least acce accessible? Fine. I think, but but Evgeny can also say his uh, his opinion. I think none. I think every discipline can be accessible because, and, and everything in our life can be accessible because the basis of our life is the cell. So if you have a tool in the hand, what you, what can, can in every part of, uh, of the body can uh, show you the, the basis of the biology, there is no yeah. other tool that can replace it. I don't know, what is your opinion, Evgen? Besides some clinical implication, I think this confocal technology gives us an unprecedented tool to study microstructure of the living human body. Yeah. And uh, as one of the research has described uh, a new organ in our body, the interstitium, by using this new technology, they were able to find these uh, channels where the interstitial fluid flows. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we will be able to study um, like in the future, some um, fluorescent integrated probes and some medications, their distribution, their subcellular localization in the cells during the surgery. Like Dr. Sanai is doing surgery where well, he injects the drugs before the surgery and see where the drugs went and whether it affected yeah. the molecular targets. The same way we can use confocal to look intraoperatively where things went and where how they are in the mm -hmm. living human in the natural conditions, not only yeah. post more. And by the way, the, this neurofunctional cases, what, what it means neurofunctional? Neurofunctional, and it means if you go and operate in eloquent areas, right? So yeah. uh, we have a few eloquent areas in, in, in the body and this, in, in the brain, and this what, um, what plays an important role if you are a surgeon is uh, don't touch these eloquent areas, yeah? So if you are able to see the eloquent areas like uh, this, what I show you that you are very, very nice, able to see the, um, the pyramidal tract. If you see the pyramidal tract and then if you see exactly on the last cell, the border where uh, the tumor is ending, yeah, and the pyramidal tract is beginning. Maybe this is a kind of technology where you don't uh, need um, uh, neurofunctional uh, tools anymore. You know, so would, would argue yeah. with this statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean. The pictures they are uh, speak their own language. Yeah, uh, you know. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think we had a very uh, great discussion. We almost uh, reached two hours, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, despite a very short time. So I would like to uh, share one uh, last slide uh, and make short announcement. Uh, if you you can see, okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, both speakers, uh, uh, Professor Abgani Belik and uh, Cleo, and Prof Cleopatra Sharalampaki, and our instant co-moderators, Alberto Faletti and Prof Jafri Malin, uh, for joining us in the discussion. And we have almost, I think, total 90 uh, participants uh, online, and some maybe uh, watching through YouTube. So uh, we would like to announce our next uh, two monthly webinar uh, for ISMIN will be held on 26, 2021, uh, same time Friday. Uh, and the topic will be focusing on minimally invasive spine surgery. So we will have a three speaker, uh, Prof. Giancarlo Gujardi, Prof. Uh, Abdul Hamid Bajamal and Professor Junichi Mizuno. And will be moderated by two of our uh, executive members of ISMIN, uh, Prof. Lucia and Sujoy Kumar from India. So I think uh, uh, with that uh, announcement, uh, I hope that uh, I will end mine. Can we have a group me, photo? Me. Yeah, yeah. Me. Just a very quick announcement because Professor Shubin just uh, uh, let me know that more than 2,000 people uh, followed and watched this webinar through WeChat. So congratulations to Asmi and to the speakers. Thank you very much. We must thank Binzu, uh, Binzu Absolutely. from Shanghai. So he... he does a great job to, to try to expand this kind of initiatives. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> and this also provide a very good platform and example for young neurosurgeon like uh, Evgeny Belik has shown that uh, despite as a resident, so you have done a tremendous job and a Cleopatra lead, uh, you know, uh, we worked before together and I'm very happy to see your development and Thank we you. look forward for future collaboration and uh, please join us again in future presentation, whichever we meet uh, and hopefully we can meet uh, physically once the COVID <laughs> pandemic over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much again. Uh, can we take a group photo? Uh, uh, Zahra, uh, Glenn. Okay, so we how would do like do this, the group photo. Yeah, like this. Okay, and then we just <laughs> smile and then we snapshot. Okay, smile everyone. Zahra, can you take the photo? Yeah, sure. <laughs> One, two, three. Okay. Okay, so we, we thank the Surabaya team, especially Professor Asra al -Fawzi. Unfortunately, he could not join us because he currently admitted because of COVID. So we pray uh, to God uh, for his speedy recovery and hope we'll meet everyone again in future. So have a safe you. stay at home. See you Take again. Care, thank you, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.